good sign. Okay, um, so um, so Dwayne, uh, please uh, take it away. All right. Um, so can um, can everybody see my slide? Oh wait, no. Let me get it playing. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, let me get my timer started here. Um, okay. Uh, well, so thank you for um, being here. So, you know, this, the presentation of this talk is based on a, some ideas that I had uh, when I was, back when I was a market practitioner during the 90s, I was one of the founders of something called Prediction Company, which was one of the first fully automated quantitative trading firms. Um, and so I had, you know, reflected a lot on how markets worked and read the literature. That's when I began reading the literature. That was my introduction to economics. I knew nothing about it before that. And so there's this theory of market efficiency that's perhaps the most prominent theory in uh, financial, um, in finance. And, you know, the idea is that prices fully reflect fundamental values. Um, I always like to think about Fisher Black's statement. He said, uh, paraphrasing perhaps a little bit, I believe in efficient markets. Prices are, are, are within fundamental values 90% of the, oh, sorry, prices are within a factor of two of fundamental values 90% of the time. <laughs> uh, so I think actually that's about right. Um, there's also the Grossman-Stiglitz paradox, which says that if Basically, if markets were perfectly efficient, there wouldn't be anything to incentivize arbitrageurs. That is, we need arbitrageurs to make the market efficient, but if markets were efficient, then there wouldn't be anything, any reason for them to be there. So there have to be some inefficiencies. Or, you know, as a physicist, I'd, I'd say that, that markets are efficient at first order and that they're necessarily inefficient at second order. Mm. Um, and it's also maybe worth thinking about the different kinds of, of efficiency. Markets may be pretty efficient in the sense that it's hard to beat them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that prices fully reflect fundamental values. If you have no way of knowing whether prices are at fundamental values, prices could be a long way from fundamental values and still be informationally efficient in the sense that you couldn't, it would be impossible to beat the market. And and I think that going back to Fisher Black statement, that's the reason that prices can stay, stray a factor of two away from fundamental values. And we may not be aware of it because there may be some people who say they're at the correct price, other people who say they're overvalued, others who say they're undervalued. Um, and, you know, so the question is, do the inefficiencies matter? Uh, the, the strong advocates of, of market efficiency like Fama would say, yeah, I know there, there are some inefficiencies, but they're really small and they really don't make much difference. Um, uh, and, you know, one can point at option pricing as a great example of the power of that assumption. But I will, I'll argue they're inappropriate by definition if you want to understand market failures. So unless you believe that markets never do anything wrong. And if they do something, or they, they never fail to perform their function of setting prices properly. Um, and that if, if, you know, the stock market drops 20% in one day, it's some outside influence, it's not the market. So unless you believe that kind of thing, I just don't think it's the right way to think about market failures. And I think market failures are common. And I think we need a theory that takes us, helps us understand what actually drives market failures. And we're never gonna get there with market efficiency. Um, now, one way to view the talk that I'm gonna to give today is as a way to interpret results from agent-based models. That is, there's now a substantial literature going back to the Santa Fe stock market model, Brock and Hamas, there are probably 50 papers now uh, with, simulations of markets where agents uh, try to find their, they're either given strategies or they try to find their strategies. They may have some ability to choose strategies. Typically they do have ability to choose strategies based on market conditions, based on what's 
for example, what's been profitable lately. Um, and in the, But to go back to the Santa Fe stock market model where they gave the market agents a fairly sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, method called a classifier system, um, they found that if, if, they, if they just gave agents the view, they said, you know, this is uh, the correct rational expectations, properly discounted price, and agents traded based on that, then they got back a market that, you know, where price returns were Gaussian <clears throat> and where, um, uh, you know, nothing happened. But if they let the agents use the classifier system to formulate strategies, some agents became fundamentalists, some became technical traders, they saw booms and busts as those strategies performed better or worse through time. And, um, and, they, and they, so they saw clustered volatility and heavy tails in price returns and the things you see in real markets. Uh, now I wanna mention a, another paper of mine here called Best Reply Structure and Equilibrium Convergence in Generic Games. In that paper, we exhaustively studied normal form games for two players. And, and I won't, I mean, we were able to do that because we, we, we came up with a theory that, that basically if people are using realistic learning algorithms, and by that I mean one that involves, um, you know, some form of, of simple learning algorithm like reinforcement learning, fictitious play, uh, many, we studied, I think, seven or eight different examples. In all those learning algorithms, you know, you have some imperfect rule that you use to update strategies. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of evidence from lab experiments that people use things like this. Uh, we even included, by the way, things like level K learning. So in other words, each player uses a learning algorithm and they assume the other player is also using the learning algorithm at level K, and then they try and go to K plus one to beat the other player. Um, so we use lots of different things and we came up with a, uh, a formalism based on best replies and where we could, that's the part where we could exhaustively study things and, uh, and actually prove some things. But, um, but the basic punchline is this, that if players use realistic learning algorithms to play normal form games, their strategies do not settle into equilibrium if the games are complicated and competitive. Complicated means that if I win, you lose and vice versa. Or, sorry, that's competitive. Complicated means that the payoff matrix of the game is, is big enough that quite a lot of information is required to specify what the game is. And um, so, you know, basically what we showed is that equilibrium is a poor assumption if, if these conditions are true, which I would argue in finance, these are commonly true. Stock market is a complicated and competitive game. And, and so equilibrium methods like finding Nash equilibria in these games provide a very poor approximation of what the players actually do in the games. And the alternative is you can just simulate the game as we, we've done. And, but still, this is all well and good. I think this is for many practical purposes, simulation, agent-based modeling is really the only way we have of understanding imperfect markets. But, but the purpose of what I'm gonna talk about now is having a conceptual framework to think about what's going on. And um, so the conceptual framework I'm gonna argue for is based on an ecological analogy to financial markets that I came up with during my time at Prediction Company. Though the paper finally got published in 2002, it was actually written in 1998 uh, when I was still at Prediction Company. And um, so how does this analogy work? Well, first of all, investment strategies correspond to species. So you take a common investment strategy like um, trend following uh, or value investing or market making, uh, statistical arbitrage, which is what we did at Prediction Company. Uh, and you should think of each of those as a species. That is, there's some set of 
of funds or investors out there in the world that follow a strategy that can roughly be speaking a set of strategies. They're not, not the same, but they can roughly be grouped together because they are similar to each other and result in somewhat similar behavior. And the wealth invested in, in a given strategy, which may be spread across many funds, corresponds to the population of the species. Notice it's not the number of funds, it's the amount of money invested in all those funds, um, because that's gonna determine the extent to which that strategy affects all the other strategies through market impact. And the wealth of strategies can change in time in response to their profits and losses. Of course, it depends on their advertising and other things, but we'll, we'll make the approximation that it's gonna be some function of their profits and losses which can boost, can amplify or damp what's going on. And that, um, and the profits and losses, this is a key point, are gonna depend on the rest of the ecosystem. That is, that they're gonna depend on the wealth of all the other strategies. So how well my strategy does depends on the set of strategies that are out there in the market and the wealth that are invested in each of them. Uh, now, so let's go to the specific setup for this model that I'm gonna present, where you know, I'm gonna walk you through an example of doing this in a very simple context. And I'm gonna show how some of the tools, the conceptual tools that ecologists use to think about biological ecologies can be used to think about markets. Um, and so we're gonna have, first of all, a single asset in this model. Um, it's a single stock, well, let me say this right. There are two assets, there's a stock and a bond. The bond is um, the, uh, what do you call it? The perfect bond in the sense that it just pays 2%. So um, it's a risk-free, uh, it's risk-free. And, um, and the stock in contrast uh, pays a variable dividend. And by the way, I just realized there's a mistake in the slide. This, the bond pays a 1% annualized coupon. The stock pays a variable dividend that works out to be around 2%. And um, uh, and so you know we can compute some fundamental value as a discounted expected future dividend, and the dividend process is going to be a discrete serially correlated geometric Brownian motion. So there's some dividend stream. We'll make the dividends pay out daily, just to keep things simple. Um, it's serially correlated, which matches up with real dividend streams, uh, you know, that uh, have some correlation in them. And the correlation provides an inefficiency that can be exploited by technical traders. And I'll get to that in just a moment. And by the way, again, stop me at any point if you have questions. I'll, I'll pause. For um, so is this an infinite horizon? Yes. Thing? I guess so, infinite horizon. Pardon me? Are you on an infinite horizon? Yeah, setting? infinite yeah. horizon, the world runs forever at a daily daily time scale. So the every people trade every day and uh, infinite horizon. Yeah, now in order, in order to price the stock, um, I mean, are you making any assumptions? What do you do about, does uh, risk preferences, do risk preferences enter here? But I, I will, uh, let, that's a good prep for my next, slide yeah. after this one I'll about to show. Okay. Um, so let me just say the way the market works is we're going to use a Walrasian price setter. So we're going to clear the market, uh, which, you know, is an approximation. Stock markets, most stock markets these days don't work that way. But okay, that's what we're going to do. And we're also going to allow short selling and leverage. And, um, and so we do that more or less in the standard way. Um, this is now getting Ed's question. We're going to have three kinds of representative strategies in this world. So we're going to just hardwire in what those strategies are. Um, and each of the strategies you can think about in terms of a signal that they respond to, to do their trading, because remember, we're doing market clearing. So e each of these has some strategies, has an information signal that drives their trading. Uh, 
the information signals just run from an algorithm. Um, the information signal will determine that agent's excess demand. And you know, we put in a sigmoid function to make sure things are smooth so that everything's differentiable and we can clear the market. And, uh, uh, but you can, the, 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 what the strategies are keying off are these signals. So there's three types of traders. The first one you can think of is, to some extent, we designed them to be ordinary investors, although one of the things you'll see is they can do surprisingly well. Um, and so their signal, phi, is just uh, given effectively as a, a, a ornstein ullenbeck process. That is, it's a weak mean reverting random walk. That is, it would be a random walk if it weren't uh, but it, but it, you know, it's it's an autocorrelated, an AR process, with a um, coefficient that's less than one, but not a whole lot less than one. And so, so in other words, if the market's under, I mean, they're basically trading at random. But if the market becomes undervalued relative to some value v of t, then they're more likely to buy. And if the market becomes overvalued, they're more likely to sell. Um, then the next kind of investor is a value investor that discounts expected future dividends, but the value investor is not aware of the autocorrelation in the dividend process. So they discount expected future dividends as if that correlation, autocorrelation were not there. And, but otherwise, they, they, are, they are able to observe the dividend process and compute their fundamental value. They share the fundamental value with the noise traders. And but the dividend, the value investor, um, you know, systematically buys when the price is undervalued and sells when the, when the stock is overvalued. And then there are trend followers who extrapolate recent trends in prices. We, for simplicity here, we assume the trends are, just, they're operating off of a one day lag on the trend. So, uh, Ed, did I answer your question here? Uh, Ed, you're on mute. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. It looks to me like you're assuming no, uh, uh, you know, um, risk aversion. You're just saying, okay, uh, everything is discounted as actual value. Yeah, I'm not, you know, uh, yeah. I'm I mean, not maximizing anybody's utility. Yeah, right, right? I mean, so All Ed, I'm doing he's not is, pricing. <laughs> he's not pricing. I'm, talking, I'm, yeah. I'm hardwiring three strategies. I'm saying, yeah, exactly. this is, this is okay. a caricature of what value. This is a the, the the second one's a caricature of what no the first one's a caricature of what uh, Joe Blow does when he invests his stock portfolio. The second one's a caricature of what Warren Buffett does, and the third one's a uh, caricature of what John Henry does. If you know the world of fund management, in other words, it's a it's a momentum trader, and I'm just so hardwiring those yeah. strategies. Yeah, I agree. And my clarifying question is. Um, are the noise traders number one? Are are they the ones who are like most accurate to what's actually going on? Most um, like so um, you mentioned that dividends are serially correlated, um, and um, obviously an OU process has negative. Well, and I think you have the the OU as negative serial correlation here. Is that right? Yeah, I have a very weak negative serial correlation. Okay. And is there any connection between the serial correlation of dividends that whose sign I don't actually know versus the weak negative serial correlation here of X? Yeah, so this, first of all, the serial correlation of dividends is positive. Okay. That corresponds to what's empirically known. And we okay. tried to match empirical facts wherever we could. Okay, um, fine. The, 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 the anti-correlation of the noise traders is an independent parameter. And I'll come back at the end and make some remarks about the effects of those two things. I should have actually included a couple of slides. But, okay. but now when you said what's, and it, it's true that actually, if you look in data, there's some indication that what these noise traders are doing here is something like what the bulk of stock investors do, but the evidence there is a little weak. Okay. Um, okay, and, any other yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, I have one. So, so um, for the noise traders here, um, 
X is the um, fraction of wealth they're allocating, um, or what is X? Yeah, good, good question. I need to think about this for a moment. Uh, what is X in this equation? So that's the value. Uh, yeah, X is multiplying value in this yeah. equation. Makes me think, right. it suggests it is a fraction of value at least. Um, and then um, let's say log so, is take re the return on that investment over time. Isn't yeah. X the mistake and in, in the noise traders mistake in, in, in valuing? Uh, yeah. Right. That's yeah. So that's that's what that is the Ornstein Uhlenbeck process. Um, but okay. what's not clear from this equation is how we're simulating. I mean, basically, the way I think about it, uh, and I hadn't actually looked at this equation in a long time. It's like an AR one process. The Ornstein Uhlenbeck process is an AR one process whose zero is the fundamental value. So if you okay, renormalize fine. prices, so fundamental value is zero. It's just an AR1 process can we, with, a, say, a coefficient of 0.99. I mean, the coefficient were one, it would be a random walk. 0.99, it's now mean reverting, and it's going around the fundamental value V. Okay. centered on the fundamental value V. Yeah. Okay. So the noise trader trades on the view that... Um, value observed on the market is headed towards fundamental value. We yeah. Can, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Think okay. of them as a value investor that doesn't pay very close attention. Okay. Okay. That's clear. Okay. Yeah. Now, in throughout the talk, I'm going to show a lot of pictures that look like this triangle on the right. So I want to pause for a minute just to let everybody absorb how that works. Um, so we have three strategies. So the wealth, there's a, a wealth vector W that's you know the wealth of these three strategies. We're gonna normalize the wealth so they sum to one and uh, for visualization purposes. And, um, and then you can think about this ternary plot where we have the noise trader uh, axis. Well, the noise trader sits in the lower left corner. The trend follower sits at the top and the value investor sits in the lower right corner and the coordinates are the relative values of these three things moving along these triangles that you see in the picture. So as you go from the top to the lower right corner, the wealth of the noise trader goes from 0% to 100%. Similarly, as you move from the lower left corner to the lower right corner, the wealth of the value investor goes from 0 to 100% and then for the trend follower to complete the circumference. So, so we'll see now several pictures like this. Okay, Question. now, yeah. Um, going back to, yes, thank you. Um, the question I have is, um, uh, I guess because the bond uh, pays 1%, there uh, is inflation, so money flows into this system. So the question I have is, um, uh, is this uh, scaling just a relative scaling or um, is there something I missed where um, there's a uh, zero sum game here? You, you, you are right that, that money is flowing into the system um, at the same time because the dividends are getting paid out, right? So the dividends are getting paid out. The bond returns are getting paid out. So the total wealth in the system is going up through time. Um, but we will just study the relative wealth of the three players. So from that point of view, th that's what these plots will mean. So this and, normalization is, uh, is then at a fixed frozen time, um, you just normalize to $1 or one. Well, at, it, at any point in time, we will do that. We will see pictures where things are changing in time. Okay, but but so the normalization is changing through time as we go along. We're actually doing all the accounting, you know, with, I mean, I think we actually started by giving them a uh, billion dollars total and then it just grows through time. At, yeah. at the rates you would expect from the assets paying off. 
like in the real I, world. I think Mike's correct. The picture on the right is at a point in time. And, um, yeah. and as we move through time, um, you know, we could turn this into a movie, but anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You'll, yeah. And you'll see several plots worth it. Okay. So right. this plot here, we asked the question, uh, so we have the noise trader, the value investor, and the trend follower. Uh, we paint this, uh, we do an experiment where we hold the wealth constant at each point in this ternary diagram. So we, we pick a wealth coordinate here, a wealth vector. And, and, and in this one, we really are holding time constant. And what we do is we let, uh, we let things go forward a few times uh, and see what the average profits are of each player. And then we color the picture based on who has the, with the color of the agent that makes the highest return with a intensity code that has to do with the size of that return. And so what you see is that there's an area here in red where the noise trader has the highest return. There's an area in blue where the value investor has the highest return. There's an area in green where the trend follower has the highest return. And then there's this kind of chaotic uh, region up here where things get messy. The things get messy up there because there are too many trend followers and the market becomes unstable. And so the answers we get really depend, you know, the market is frequently crashing. And so basically you shouldn't, we don't view this as a very plausible uh, region uh, when when there are too many trend followers in the world, it is unstable. Um, but in the uh, lower part, yeah. yeah. Oh, you just said the market's frequently crashing. So what's leading to the asymmetries? Or like, why isn't the market frequently jumping up as well? The, the market also is frequently jumping up. The market just is is unstable. Okay. So it's careening up and down because with, when they're trend followers, if they're trend following up, they can push the price up as much as, you know, they can just go to infinity or they can push it down to zero. Okay, um, thank you. And okay, and interestingly, you see this point in the center where, uh, where the three of them intersect, right? And so one then can plausibly think that there is a fixed point there where the market is in some sense uh, efficient and indeed, uh, if you, uh, in this picture, what we do is we hold the um, noise traders wealth constant at the wealth corresponding to that point, which is I think 42% or something like that. And then we sweep the wealth of the trend follower and the wealth, and which then automatically sweeps the wealth of the value investor. So you can see the wealth of the trend follower across the top going from 38% to whatever that says. I can't, uh, let me see, I'm gonna close some junk here because uh, I'm getting stupid things on my screen. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, oh, and I wait, I went forward a slide without meaning to. No, why can't I, go? oh yeah, there we go back, all right. So the trend follower's wealth is going from 38% to 8% across the top, which means automatically the value investor's wealth is going from 19% up to 49% because we're holding the noise trader's wealth constant. And so what you see is that as we increase the uh, value investor's wealth, the return for the trend follower goes up and the return for the value investor goes down and there's an intersection point in the middle, which sits at that efficient point. And, and that is where the returns of all three of the strategies are about the same. Now, one of the things you see is the volatility, which is below of the profit streams of those agents don't behave like that. Those volatilities are actually both monotonically decreasing uh, as the value investor's wealth goes up. So that is showing you there's an asymmetric effect of these strategies on the market. Um, Dwayne, why are you, yep. um, when all three types of in investors have the same return, you're calling the market efficient. And I'm wondering why you're using that word. Okay. 
it's efficient in the sense just a second my son just got up and left this door open i'm going to close the door okay hello minimize the sound <clears throat> so I'm, I'm calling it efficient because again not worrying about um about uh volatility That's me. for a minute um if so if yes, you're not fine. worrying about how are you Ed, hey, I, uh, think you need, hey. I think you need to mute. Yeah. I'm going to mute Ed. Ed? <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, looking for Ed to mute him. It's fine. Uh, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> he probably can't hear us. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm looking for Ed as a host. Um, hey, right. um, Avi, you can help me too. Um, so, okay. Wait, wait, just sorry. So, um, call from my too many people on this. <laughs> you have too many. <laughs> Participants. Yeah. Okay. Oh, come on. Peter, do mute you know. all for the time being. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Mute all. Yeah. You. you know. Um, I don't mute. Okay. Okay. Now I just have to unmute our speaker. Uh, there's Dwayne, and I'm going to ask you to unmute Dwayne. Okay. So, Dwayne, please unmute. Oh, shoot. There he is. All right, I've got myself unmuted, I think. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, okay, so um, yes, where were we? So from the point of view of, um, uh, why, why do I call this an efficient market? Because the returns are all the same. So nobody's making an excess return. Um, there is some difference in the volatility of all the players. So under a more sophisticated idea of efficient markets, then we'd have to choose utility functions and so on. You could argue things aren't still efficient, but, but you know, so that would move this point around if investors were taking uh, risk into account and making their decisions. But I think there still will be some point, and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, where, um, where uh, now I'm, there we go. And so let me show you this next picture and then we can discuss the sense in which this is efficient or not. Um, so now what I'm showing you here is a picture where what we do is we start, we take each point in the wealth triangle and we, you know, take an average over several simulations going forth from that point. And we take the average change in the wealth vector. So that is, we reduce this to a deterministic, the approximation of a deterministic dynamical system. So in other words, it's as if we start at that point, if there were no noise, then where would we go next in this diagram? Mm -hmm. What are the wealth dynamics through time? And so you can see, and we plotted out the dynamical system. There's a, a dot here corresponding to that efficient point that I said before, where the returns are all the same. And where, you know, effectively you can think about this as it, it, we, have, we have to have a model for fund reallocation, if we use a very simple model for fund reallocation, which is that the funds just reinvest their wealth. And if we allow them to go into a deterministic world where they always get their mean return, mean hmm. expected return, then hmm. we will flow along this diagram. And for most of the initial conditions, we flow into this efficient point in the center of the diagram. Mm -hmm. Again, this is an efficient point with respect to the fund reallocation yeah. model of so passive also, investment. Yeah, it's also like an attracting point. <laughs> it's an attracting uh, fixed point. Yeah, okay. Okay, so okay. yeah, um, okay, okay, I see now. So, um, look, all right, so it sounds, I mean, um, so I think what you're uh, thinking is that at time zero, markets are inefficient, and I agree with that too. Uh, and you're interested to talk about um, as time goes by, you know, what, what's needed to, um, let's say, achieve efficiency, which means um, that what you just described, essentially, that once we get there, we stay there. <laughs> Is that fair? That's uh, fair. That's a, that's a very useful, useful summary of what we're thinking now. Okay. Um, okay. That's good. Any that's other questions? Now. The, um, 
Uh, other than that one point in the middle that you've talked about a lot, it looks like there are in the kind of upper left, there are stable points, which are zero, all the other ones are zero value investors. Is that correct? Um, you, upper left, yeah, there's, there's still the chaotic region in the upper left where things go kind of crazy, which you shouldn't pay too much attention to uh, up toward the top of the diagram. There's also some trajectories that, um, uh, there's also some questions about what happens at the, the bottom. That is along the boundaries, things can flow along the boundaries because one of the strategies goes extinct. And so there's only two strategies and then you have dynamics along the boundary, which are what the three points on the boundary are about. Because those are the places on the boundary where things will get, uh, will move to but then you can see once you're on there, any, any perturbation away from the boundary will move you as the arrows show. Okay. Okay. Sorry, now, uh, brief question. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a little bit confused. That it's like, for me, it's like just a simulation for, uh, for particular investors, but how, Maybe we can make it in settings like uh, dynamic Bayesian games settings to have like some updates uh, for the different types of investors and also can maybe come up with some uh, similar results. Then compare with that, this method seems not that interesting from my point of view. So, okay, let me rephrase your question. We could have made the investors more rational, right? We could have, for example, made them Bayesians, or we could have used a Kelly rule. Um, and certainly it's true that if, you know, in the limit where you make all the investors rational, they, they should all become the same investor and we should be back to rational expectations equilibrium model. Um, but that's not what I'm interested in doing here. What I'm interested in doing is, is saying, let's look out in the world. In the world, we see a very strong differentiation of investor types, okay? Uh, there's a lot of specialization going on. Specialization happens because we're boundedly rational. And, um, and so I wanna study the world where that happens, where for whatever reason, nobody can do the information. Either they don't have the information or they're not capable of doing the information processing. And so we have specialized strategies. Now, we could study what happens if we evolve towards a more rational world, but let's maybe save that for the end. Okay. Um, Question. Yeah. Um, I, I heard what you just said in reply uh, to that question. And I, uh, I agree to some extent, but I would point out something that I strongly disagree with. Um, it, even if, everyone were rational in the way you describe it. I, I don't accept the uh, notion that they would um, converge to the same investor because rational people have different time frames. And, and since someone may be uh, investing as a young person with a long time scale and another as an older person with a shorter time scale, that's going to uh, uh, drive a diversity of uh, strategies and results. Yeah. Okay. Well, then your your statement just supports what I'm trying to say. I, I don't care about. I, I don't want to quibble about this because it's it's orthogonal to the point I'm trying to make here. Okay. Uh, uh, so yeah. So as long as we agree that there's a diversity of strategies, then I think what I'm saying here applies. Mm -hmm. So that that not everybody does the same thing. That's all that it, that that's all this requires. Just take the three strategies I picked as an example. There's a whole set of research, there's a whole research program to more exhaustively investigate what, how this changes as you change the specific examples of strategies to be studied. And because the, the way, the details of the way this picture looks are not universal. Some of the methods of analysis I would hope are. And let me uh, check the time there so I should move along a bit. Um, so now, but on the other hand, remember this picture I made here was made by assuming determinism. That is we averaged over the future course of events to get the average return of the funds. And then we assumed the wealth dynamics followed the average return. 
But that's not what's really going on because if you think about reinvestment, you know, we're actually playing this a step at a time. Every day we clear the market, uh, the noise trader makes their random number, the, the dividend process has a random number in it, the um, size of the returns to the three investors fluctuate depending on those random numbers. And so there's a lot of noise in the system. And, um, and so that is the performance is not deterministic. So here's what happens when we instead just follow specific trajectories along through time. So take that red cross in the middle of the picture. That's the um, uh, starting point. And then we simulate for 200 years of simulated time. You have to believe that we're able to calibrate things so that that, descent, that corresponds to 200 years. Simulate 200 years of simulated time. You see what that trajectory does through time. Similarly, I show a green trajectory and a blue trajectory. And you see they, they tend to get closer to that fixed point, but they don't land on the fixed point even after 200 years. Um, Next diagram shows what happens if we start out with lots of cases and we take a snapshot, we put a little blue dot after 200 years. So this blue smear corresponds to the probability distribution for what happens after 200 years. So once again, we see well that black dot corresponding to the fixed point lies somewhere within the support of that distribution. Uh, it's not even uh, clearly at the most at the peak, and the distribution is quite broad. So, so this makes a key point. The time scale to move towards efficiency is slow, and, uh, and the approach to efficiency is not sharp. There's the smear of points, not as a single point. And um, so I don't think I need that slide again. Now, why is it? Now, this is a, something I pointed out back in 2000, back in my 1998 preprint. Because uh, this is something I was really worried about as a fund manager. The time, let's suppose you really do have a strategy that beats the market. Okay, how, how do you know that your strategy actually beats the market? How can you prove that to somebody? Well, so there, let's suppose you have some boost delta S over the sharp ratio corresponding to a buy and hold. And so you want to you show with, um, sigma levels of significance, like say two standard deviations. So you might put two for sigma, put delta S below, then um, the time that you're going to have to trade in order to have a track record that you can then use to market your fund uh, corresponds roughly to this formula. This is under idealized conditions of normality and, and you know, no correlations and so on. Um, so just to plug in some numbers in here, if you put in two standard deviations and you, you suppose that your boost and sharp ratio over the rest of the market is in annualized terms 0.2, then um, that number in the parenthesis is 10. So the time it takes for you to trade is 100 years. So if your investors actually want a two sigma verification that you have a good performance, it's gonna take you hundred years to offer them that. Um, you know, even if your boost in sharp ratio is one, I mean, a prediction company, thank God we had two, but if it's one, then it's still gonna take four years for you to demonstrate your superior performance. And that's to have a two sigma validation that you're not zero. That doesn't mean it's actually one. It just means that you have two sigmas that you're not zero. So the point is, if you look at typical famous investors like Warren Buffett, this tau is a big number, certainly more than a decade. Um, and now there's another paper that, uh, I guess I didn't put the site here, that I have with uh, Dmitry Cherkashin and Seth Lloyd, where we show the rate of convergence slows down as efficiencies approach, and it converges as a power law, t to the minus gamma with an exponent that's between zero and one. So in other words, the time that it takes to, to approach efficiency is slow. And why is it slow? Because the closer you get to that point, the weaker the forces are that are causing you to approach that point. So the, and then the bigger the effect the noise has. So things are slow. So you should expect that 
the market's going to spend a lot of time away from that efficient point. That's the key take home. Uh, now, some more pictures to look at here. Uh, the picture on the left, we show the autocorrelation in prices, the first autocorrelation. And you can see, if you look at the color code, that white corresponds to lack of autocorrelation. And there is indeed this white strip running across the figure. And the efficient point sits on that white strip. So yes, the trend followers, because the trend followers are able to exploit the, auto, the positive autocorrelation in the dividend process, because they see it reflected in the prices that the value investors will set. Um, uh, so they can move the market to that point, but we may see fluctuations around that point over time. Similarly, if you look at valuations, um, you know, the, there's a lot of variation in whether the market is correctly priced depending on the wealth of the strategies. And I'm worried I'm running out of time here. So I'm gonna breeze through some things and then maybe we could do some questions. I wanna just demonstrate a few things that um, people do in ecology. There's something called the community matrix which is maybe it's most helpful to look at the definition on the right. If, if pi i is the um, uh, return uh, on the strategy as a fun of i, so let's say you're the value investor. So how does the return of the value investor change as the wealth of one of these other strategies changes? So we already, I already should have convinced you that there's a lot of what's called density dependence depending on where you are in that diagram, the uh, returns to your strategy are gonna change. So let's take this partial derivative. So this matrix GIJ called the community matrix in ecology tells us how the returns of each strategy are affected by changes in the wealth of the other strategies. And let me just say, this is because in some sense, the strategies are all feeding off of each other. It's inefficiencies in the market this, these are like predators that feed on inefficiencies in the market. And so we compute this community matrix sitting at the equilibrium. And we see that kind of as we expect, the diagonal, the terms are all negative. It's bad for you if you have competition. Competition's a negative thing. On the other hand, the thing that surprised me is all the off diagonal terms are positive. And though when you think about it a minute at the equilibrium point, that's not surprising. If you move away from, at the equilibrium point, nobody has an edge over anybody else. As soon as somebody acquires more wealth and moves away from the equilibrium point, then you can begin to exploit them. And so you actually have what's called mutualism at the equilibrium point where everybody uh, actually wants the wealth of their competitor to increase or at least to change away from the equilibrium. Actually, they want it to increase. You want your competitor's wealth to increase because if you go back to this plot early on, okay, wait, sorry, I went too fast. You go back to this plot here, you see that um, the trend followers tend to do well when the trend follower wealth is low. The value investor does well when the value investor's wealth is low. The noise trader does well when the noise trader's wealth is low. So you want to be in the minority. All right. Um, and now when you move away from that equilibrium point, then the community matrix changes and gets more complicated. And so here's an example. And you know, now we have some negative terms off here and you can see, you can get things like predator prey interactions. A predator prey interaction means that if your wealth gets bigger, my return goes up. If my wealth gets bigger, your return goes down. If that's true, then I'm a predator and you're a prey. Um, and so you, we can then use this to construct a food web. We construct a food web the same way that ecologists construct them. That is for an ecologist, this matrix AIJ in this figure is a dietary fraction for species I eating species J. In our case, we compute AIJ by looking at the profits that strategy I makes. Uh, and we compare the profits we make when we remove um, uh, when we remove strategy J. And so, so we, we take that and then 
we just say the trophic level is one higher than the thing you eat. If, you know, so if you had a perfect world of uh, grass, zebras, and lions, uh, zebras eat grass, lions eat zebras, that's their entire dietary fraction. You get trophic levels of one, two, three. If you have more realistic trophic levels, you get you still get you get some answer. It's not necessarily integers. Anyway, over on the right, you see a picture where we've got the main situation where the equilibrium is, uh, this is not stated in the most coherent way. The equilibrium is noise trader, uh, value investor, trend follower is the red area. And you see the equilibrium lies inside that. There's also a significant mass in this gray zone. In the gray zone, the trophic levels are not defined because there's cycles. And so it's like with cannibalism, you can get cycles um, and the trophic levels become undefined. So most of the time the system's either in the standard case of uh, where the noise traders on the bottom, value investor, trend followers on the top, some of the time you're in this area where they're undefined. Now, let me give the punchline slide and then I hopefully will still have a little time to take questions. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's okay, suppose you're a regulator. How, how might this help you understand what's going on? Or actually suppose you're a market practitioner and you wanna, you wanna understand how your strategy, where you sit in the ecosystem. So what we show here is a plot of volatility uh, so, so the orange color code there corresponds to volatility. Deep, deep brown orange is high volatility. This area out here is low volatility. We follow another representative trajectory. Again, this one's for 200 years. So we see this trajectory moving around and we see it does at some point actually go roughly through this equilibrium point, but it fluctuates a lot. And over on the right, we see some time series corresponding to the volatility, which is shown in orange, and the um, mispricing, well, which is also shown in orange in the panel below it. And, and we compare that to a predictor. So how do we get that predictor? We, we take a time series of volatility. We take, um, the wealth of the trend follower, the value investor and the noise trader. And we then do a regression and we make a linear model connecting the two. And then we just predict from that regression what we think the volatility will be. Similarly, we do that for the mispricing. And what we see is that we make a pretty good prediction. It's not perfect, but we make a pretty good prediction for the volatility. Uh, and by the way, you notice the volatility is spiking up and down and in a, quasi realistic looking way in that we see upward spikes of volatility followed by downward trends and then new upward spikes. It's much better than you would get if you used a Garch model. You have a very unrealistic volatility series from a Garch model. Um, and, and that we can do a pretty good job of predicting it. And what are we using it to predict it? We're predicting it based on the endogenous dynamics of this system. Okay, this volatility is indirectly related to what the dividends are doing, but we aren't seeing these huge volatility spikes because we happen to get a particularly big dividend payment or because the value investor, sorry, sorry, the noise trader happened to generate a large random number. We're getting it because the system's in a configuration where it becomes sensitive. And in fact, if you look in this picture over here, you see that there's kind of a volatility cliff here. When we hit the volatility cliff, that destabilizes the trend follower or that, that, that's bad for the trend follower. So we, we tend to see uh, fast action in the wealth dynamics when that's going on. And so volatility changes a lot. Uh, so um, just to say then the, the, the punchline is that we, we can, the endogenous dynamics, wealth dynamics predict volatility and mispricing Volatility and mispricing are market malfunctions. So we're able to predict the market malfunctions. Why? Because we aren't assuming the market's efficient. We're assuming it's inefficient. And we're actually looking at what's driving at, at the deviations from efficiency. And by the way, if you look in the, the last plot here where you see the value investor wealth, the trend follower wealth, you can see how um, uh, 
their dynamics are related. They actually, there it tends to be that the, like, and this is an example where the trend followers wealth is going up while the value investors wealth is going up. This is relating to the behavior in the community matrix that um, uh, to some extent, all boats tend to rise with the tide. Um, so I think I have one more slide, just a second. Um, so just to summarize the economies in ecology, uh, well, no, this isn't a summary actually. L uh, let me just say, I've done a lot of other thinking about how to use ecology and economics, not just in finance, where you think about companies as specialists, workers as specialists, they have, assume they have bounded rationality. And you know, my philosophy about models is they should have what I call verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. That is, I don't like as if assumptions, I like as is assumptions. I wanna make my assumptions about the world close to the way the world really is. And I wanna just conclude by saying what this is, what I think this is potentially good for, it could help practitioners understand their co-evolving environment. Uh, so you wanna track something like how many people are in your space. If the space is too crowded, you're probably starting to get in trouble. Um, and I think regulators could use this to understand the likely outcome of regulation, monitor stability, intervene when necessary. You know, some truths come out like trend followers are dangerous. You can have some, and they can be even be useful to get rid of the autocorrelations, but too many trend followers spells trouble. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You could use this to study the introduction of exotic species like mortgage-backed securities leading up to the crisis of 2008. And, you know, because if you're a regulator, you potentially can capture everybody's trades. You can actually study, you can actually map out what the ecology is by looking at what the population of the different species are, and you can potentially model what's going on. So I think it offers some promise in that regard. And on that, I'll end. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions or comments. Um, I can start. Um, and oh, so Sasha actually wants to, oh, quite a few people raising hands. Let, let me let people participate here. So uh, just to unmute yourself, uh, Sasha, and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, I was wondering, do you have this code for these simulations available somewhere that we could play around with it? And because I have to say that I've had ideas that resemble yours in many, you know, in the many times in the past, and often when once I try to get it to run, it just doesn't work well. So it would be really helpful to have like, you know, uh, a starting point to play around with these uh, these models. Sure. I mean, kind of in the details, right? The, yeah, no, I, the, I, I, we, do, we do. I believe the code is available now. Martin's been working hard to make it available. He's been cleaning it up. Actually, we need to make it, he needs to make it available to the rest of my group because I now have several students working on this kind of thing. And so we'd be very happy to make the code available. If you send me an email, if you have my email, then I can pass it along to Martin. Otherwise oh. I'll or I can interact with Peter. Sure, yeah, I'd love to, I'll send you an email because, you know, one of the question marks is, you know, you would think that the, the rational, you know, dividend following person, if the dividends are ultimately distributed to the trader, you'd think they'd make everyone else extinct because, but, but you know, well, of course, I, I think there's details that, you know, for example, I've seen the wealth of the value investor really drops dramatically a few times like in your last slide um, yeah. so, you know those are things that yeah. be like you know make me curious like why is this happening <laughs> yeah no and we'd love to to have you play with it and get your reaction let me just reiterate that the value investor doesn't know about the autocorrelation of the dividend process so we intentionally kept that from them to allow the trend follower to be viable uh, i think there's a lot of work that could be done in playing with the strategies and studying richer eco ecosystems of strategies, because you know you just make three up and you stick them in and they're not gonna be realistic in several ways. And you know, in reality, it probably matters that you have whole distribution of different strategies, not just three representative strategies. But we'd, we'd love it if you played with it. Let me also make one other remark, which is that we are actually working to try and do this in a more realistic way, we're using 13F filings where you get snapshots of mutual fund holdings to um, try and reverse engineer mutual fund strategies and then simulate markets in a more realistic way and study things like index strategies, 
which we think become destabilizing when they become too large. And um, uh, so we, we are actually trying to do this in a more realistic scale, but we, uh, I'd love to pass your code and get your responses. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I have right. a question. Quick question, Peter. Uh, just uh, uh, thank you so much for the presentation, though, very, though, very informative. And I just wonder if in the last part that you mentioned with all the ecological perspective, have you tried any simulation or put this framework on the resistant dynamics framework, like the one from MIT that could help you to simulate that ecological evolution? Yeah, so no, as the, as the short answer. In order to do that, we would have to understand one could make a simulation dynamics model possibly, but we'd have to understand uh, what, uh, like what are these community matrices and how do they vary? How, what is their density dependence? Uh, that actually reminds me of a remark I meant to make. I mean, I did in my 2002 paper derive Lotka Volterra equations. So I don't know how much you know about population biology, but in, in Lotka Volterra equations are the most famous equation in population biology. Uh, they showed that, like under predator prey interactions, you can actually get cyclical behavior where the population of the two species oscillate indefinitely. Um, uh, it's not clear whether that ever happens in financial markets. Um, I had to make very strong assumptions. I had to assume away the density dependence in order to drive the Lotka Volterra equations, the quadratic Lotka Volterra equations. Um, but uh, let's say that would be an example of something you might be able to do with systems dynamics. The one comment though, the noise plays a big role in this. And I worry that the systems dynamics framework is, is too deterministic. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how to fill in the missing parts for that. All right, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, yes, thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time. Um, Abby, you can uh, hit stop recording. And uh, just like to say, Dwayne, thanks so much. I mean, it was really a brilliant uh, talk and uh, the original idea has uh, definitely worth further study as you've been doing. And I'm sure many of us will, will attempt to do that. Okay, okay. Um, All right. thanks again. Thanks. All right. Thank so, you guys. Bye-bye.